Uh, I knew him to his publications mainly. Um, he has done some really nice structure work, but now I want to first introduce him to you as you know who he is and where he's coming from. So Ming did his uh, bachelor's, uh, he got his bachelor's degree from Wuhan University in 1982. And then he completed a PhD in Purdue in 87, from which he immediately got his uh, faculty position at University of Alabama. And he has been there since for the past 20, 26. 26 years. <laughs> and this is a very exceptional path because everybody who is a physicist or physics oriented and comes in to do you know, virus work or structure work, they usually have to do a large postdoc. And I think that one of the reasons why Mink had such a short path has been the exceptional training he got in Michael Rosman's lab. It was like a really big lab focused on very fundamental virology questions. Um, and so when he started his lab, he had a leg up on the competition. And it's very easy to see that through the subsequent papers that came out. So he has done some very fundamental work on the crystal structure and structures of proteins in influenza. And also on my favorite protein, which is also my favorite, too. <laughs> favorite uh, uh, virus, uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV. And so it's, it's really great. It has been awesome to have him here and, and, and interact and become friends. And the one thing that I noticed that we have in common is that we really think of ourselves as virologists. So he has ended up, uh, you know, he, I think he is, he's a very quantitative guy. He's a biophysicist. He has all of that. But he's one of the generation of us who is going to rewrite, in a way, virology. So it's very exciting to have you here, Ming. And uh, welcome. Thank you, Saeed, for the nice introduction. So I'm going to discuss the details of our work on VSV nuclear capsid. First, let me give you a brief introduction about negative strand RNA viruses. So this large collection of viruses is called negative, strand, uh, negative single-stranded RNA viruses that include eight different virus families, and there are many important human pathogens that are in this class. For instance, influenza virus, we have heard many uh, uh, risky or dangerous cases of avian influenza infecting humans or swine influenza get into humans cause pandemic in uh, 2009. But there are also other important pathogens which are not very well studied, including measles virus, uh, some we have a vaccine against measles, but there are now new outbreaks of measles in developing countries as well as in the United States. Respiratory syncytial virus, we don't have an effective vaccine yet and no antivirals. This caused a lot of uh, hospitalization of infants, young children, and more dangerous like rabies virus or Ebola viruses. So this class of viruses uh, is numerous, but the studies are limited. I would like to uh, point to one important feature of negative strength of RNA virus. That is its uh, nucleotide synthesis. What separates negative strength from the rest of the, uh, the biosphere is the, the way it makes its viral RNA, both in transcription and replication, is different. For instance, if you look at a normal cell, the g genome of a cell is a double-strand DNA. The cell polymerase use the DNA as a template for either duplicating the double-strand DNA or transcribe the genes to produce messaging RNAs, microRNAs, and, and other RNAs. For viruses, the templates uh, have more variety. It could be double-strand DNA or double-strand RNA. And some are positive strand RNA where the genome can be directly used as a messenger RNA for translation. But for negative strand, the template is not the nucleotide itself. It's not the RNA. It is the RNA nucleocapsid complex that is used as a template. 
if you isolate the RNA genome alone and subject that to the viral polymerase, it doesn't recognize it. It doesn't know that's the template for viral RNA synthesis. So this is one unique feature, separate negative strand uh, viruses from the rest of the biosphere. So that's why we focus on the nuclear capsid. So we use VSV as the prototype to study this large class of viruses. VSV is very simple. It has a linear genome of about 11,000 nucleotides, and it encodes only five proteins. The first one is called the nuclear capsid protein, N, phosphor protein matrix, glycoprotein, and L protein. The glycoprotein is a surface protein embedded in the viral envelope on the outside. Underneath the viral membrane envelope is the matrix protein, and inside the matrix protein is the nuclear capsid. That's the protein and RNA genome complex. And inside of this cubercidical, uh, super, super helical structure of the nuclear capsid, there are some L and P proteins uh, packaged together because this is a negative strand RNA virus, so it has to carry its polymerase, which is the uh, L protein and the phosphor protein, which is a cofactor of the polymerase. So and that's, excuse me. They're not randomly distributed anymore. Uh, I, did I mention random? I didn't. <laughs> okay. They are packaged. We are, we are very sensitive to that. I'm that. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They are not random, but they are all over the place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so but another feature is this viral particle has a very unique shape. So one end is kind of pointed, and the other end is blunt. So it's called this a bullet-shaped uh, viral particle. So I will explain the reason why the virus takes this shape. Uh, this is a cartoon showing the replication cycle of this virus. So outside, you have this envelope virion has glycoprotein on the outside. The glycoprotein recognizes a host receptor protein molecule. is the LDL receptor and family proteins. That uh, initiate the internalization of the virus particle uh, through endocytosis mechanism. This endosome uh, will uh, eventually become acidic. That triggers the membrane fusion and release the nuclear capsid and L and P protein. Once this complex is released into the cytoplasm, the transcriptions take place and new uh, viral proteins are produced that will switch the uh, phase of replication to copying uh, viral genomes. When the proteins and newly synthesized genomes are, are transported to the cytoplasm membrane, the virus starts to assemble and butt out from the plasma membrane in these uh, bullet-shaped particles. One thing you should notice is through the entire cycle, both in the virion, uh, in the cytoplasma during the transcription and the replication, the viral genome is never exposed. It's always staying inside the nuclear capsid. So this is different from all the other viral replication cycles. So this uh, nuclear capsid really has a unique structure that dictates a unique mechanism of replication. So we produce the recombinant protein in E. coli. We know the phosphor protein is required as a chaperone to keep N protein soluble. So we co-express them in one copy of messenger RNA. But we have two ribosomal binding sites, so the two proteins can be translated uh, almost simultaneously. The P protein forms the dimer and associated with N and keep it uh, in check. Uh, we have a heat tag uh, on the P protein, so we can co-purify P protein and N protein in almost equal amount. But to our surprise, when we uh, got this complex, we find a single piece of RNA inside, uh, which is nuclear, uh, which is 90, nu uh, nu 90 nucleotides long. Uh, the sequence is random. It's basically different copies of messenger RNAs uh, in, the, in the E. coli. We can remove the P protein by subject the complex to low pH, in which the P protein precipitated out. We only have the N protein left. Even at this harsh condition, the RNA is protected and stay with the N protein. And later on, we collaborate with uh, Dr. Lee's group 
and did a three-dimensional structure reconstruction uh, from negative stained uh, EM images. As you can see, there are 10 copies of the N-protein subunit. The RNA is in, in between the protein and, and form a circle inside. And this uh, ring structure, uh, later on, we crystallized into large single crystals, and we can uh, get X-ray diffractions beyond three angstrom resolution and eventually solve the crystal structure of the nRNA complex. Uh, so at, this, at the time we solved the structure of VSV nRNA complex, uh, Dr. Rugrat's group in Embo uh, Laboratory in France solved the structure of rabies uh, nRNA complex. These two viruses are closely related and the structures are almost identical. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, Felix Ray's group solved the structure of RSV in RNA complex. And if you compare all these structures, they have very similar construction. So to represent the overall uh, scheme of assembly, you can think the N protein has two domains. At the N terminal end, you have one globular domain with uh, alpha helices and some beta strands. At the C-terminal end, you have another uh, globular uh, domain with only alpha helices. But we also notice there's a long extension we call the N-terminal arm uh, from the N-terminus, and also there's a large loop uh, inserted in the N-terminal domain. Those two structural features are important for assembly. Uh, after we got the structure, we can trace the entire uh, RNA molecule inside the protein. Uh, if you have the complete protein domain plotted, you won't be able to see the RNA molecule at all. So the RNA is completely sequestered within the capsule. The protein protects everything. So now I remove the N-terminal domain, only have the uh, footprint of the C-terminal domain. So you can see the uh, nucleotides of this RNA inside. Each protein subunit are associated with nine nucleotides. So that's why there are 90 in this 10 uh, N subunit ring. Uh, we arbitrarily uh, label them one through nine. If you look at the first four nucleotides, the bases all stack together, and the conformation of the stacked bases uh, is similar to half of the A form RNA duplex. And the phases facing outside, the bases face to the solvent accessible uh, direction. But the other four, five, seven, eight, nine, also stacked together have a conformation of a half duplex, but all the bases face the interior. So if the protein conformation does not change, the polymerase has no way to get access to the RNA sequence if it's inside the nuclear capsid. So somehow, during the viral RNA synthesis, the polymerase recognize the nuclear capsid at the same time have to open the structure, get the RNA out, and read the sequence. But after the viral RNA synthesis is completed, the nuclear, uh, nuclear capsid structure is completely restored. The RNA is put back into its original structure. And later on, some other structures from the negative strand RNA virus families are also solved. Here I'm, uh, I show the Rift Valley fever and uh, lacrosse. They belong to the negative strand uh, viruses, the Bonia virus family, uh, but uh, they, they don't have any sequence homology to the structure we see, as well as RSV. But if you only look at the protein fold, we find some common features among the entire uh, class. So for VSV and RSV, they have this similar fold with a cavity in between the two domains. For VSV, it accommodates nine nucleotides. For RSV, it accommodates six, uh, or seven, I'm sorry. And four of them face outside, and three of them face inside. So it's very similar to VSV. For uh, rough valley fever, uh, the RNA is not as completely uh, inserted or sequestered by the protein, but all the bases are covered, and four, four of them stack together in the middle. And for the cross, 
I believe there were three or four which are stacked together. But they all have this similar uh, arrangement with two domains with a cavity in the middle where the RNA sits. And so these, these cavities are really not, you know, the binding is not really sequence dependent. They would bind any RNA. Almost. Correct. So that was yeah. the purpose of the previous experiments. Too. So what you guys put down was just regular cellular mRNA. Problems. Correct. Stuff yes. Yeah. 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 So I did some uh, structural superposition. As you can see, for VSV and RSV, we can almost superimpose the entire structure. They have basically the same fold, same conformation. Uh, when we compare uh, VSV and uh, Rift Valley fever, only the N-terminal domain can be superimposed. The C-terminal domain now has a completely different conformation, as well as uh, the cross and even between them. So here I draw a cartoon to show the topology of this fold. We call this a 5H plus 3H motif. Five helices from the N-terminal domain and three helices from the C-terminal domain. So we can see the five helices throughout these four various uh, families, they are all conserved, have exactly the same topology and the same uh, conformation. But for the C-terminal domain, only the RSV and the VSV can be superimposed. In case of Rift Valley fever and La Crosse, uh, there is a significant conformational change of this uh, helix in the five helix motif. It changes, so it drags down the C-terminal domain to a lower uh, position. So that open cavity now is more collapsed than before. So it only accommodates a few uh, nucleotides. But the tomology is basically the same through them. So we think they have the same common uh, ancestor during evolution. And the mechanism for putting them together uh, very similar. So through our studies, we made a few new observations which contradict to the previous belief by other groups. First thing we claimed is the N protein should not be a RNA binding protein at all. It should just be called a regular capsid protein. Let me show you some of the experimental results, why we think that way. First of all, if a protein is a RNA specific binding protein, you will find a defined pattern or distinct pattern of interaction between positively charged residues and the phosphate group. So that binding mechanism has to be conserved uh, among the same uh, protein families. So now we are comparing VSV and rabies. The protein fold and RNA accommodation are almost identical. But if you look at what positively charged residues are making interactions with the phosphate groups, they are not conserved at all. They are in different places. Only one of the amino acids are actually in the same position but sequence-wise, it's almost 20 amino acids away. So what we think is just like any other RNA viral capsids, you put the RNA inside the capsid, and somehow the protein needs to neutralize the negatively charge. So you can use uh, a sequence from here or there. As long as the charge are neutralized, then it will be able to encapsulate that RNA. So that's a typical uh, structural function uh, feature of capsid protein, not a specific RNA binding protein. We also notice the extensive cross molecular interactions between subunits. So I draw four uh, parallel uh, subunits. If you focus on the one in the middle, the red one, we see the two domains, N terminal domain and the C terminal domain. Uh, we see close contacts between the N-terminal domains. So side by side, they have a large area of contacts. We also notice the N-terminal arm from the red subunit make close contacts with the back of the C-terminal domain uh, on the left, and also make contacts with the loop from the next one, uh, two molecules away. And so on the right side... This is taking out of the crystal structure. I only focus, we have 10 protein subunits in the 
crystal structure. So what we're looking is one, uh, one unit cell? Uh, if, uh, the unit cell contain, or uh, asymmetric unit contain five subunits. So this is the four of them. This is the fifth one. They are in a linear uh, circular orientation. And the C-terminal uh, loop make contacts with the one on the right. <coughs> so there are three unique contacts among four unique subunits in terms of position. And this kind of pattern can repeat itself throughout the ring or throughout the genome. So that's another typical uh, feature of nucleic uh, uh, capsid, viral capsid, where they use repeated pattern of interactions to keep the protein together. So we can think of this nucleic capsid as a capsid, which is like a tube instead of a sphere. It's a tube where the RNA just goes through the center. So to test this hypothesis, we did some mutational studies. First, we deleted N-terminal arm, 22 amino acids. That uh, removed the contact of 1 and 3 on the left. So after we delete the N-terminal arm, we didn't touch anything where the RNA sits. The cavity is uh, intact. Nothing changed there. We can isolate a PN protein complex, but it does not form that ring anymore. Also, it has no RNA inside based on this uh, absorption of UV at 290 over 280 nanometers. So this indication, if you don't assemble this complete nuclear capsid, you won't have this RNA inside. We also shorten the loop, which make contacts with the uh, pr uh, protein something on the right. Uh, by deleting a few residues from that, we also got the same result. No RNA inside, a smaller complex. The third mutation we made does not even delete anything. We notice there's a close contact between the C-terminal domain uh, subunits uh, that are uh, charged uh, salt bridge interactions and also hydrophobic interactions. So we mutate the sequence here uh, from five different amino acids to the same alanine, five alanine at this region. Just by changing the contacts between the subunits, now we only isolate a monomer of N-protein subunit complex with P-dimer. We precisely know what the size is. There's no ring forming, and there's no RNA. So this mutational study indicate it is the assembled capsid which is important for encapsulating RNA, not individual subunit that interact with RNA. Another observation we made is the RNA itself is not even required for the capsid assembly. Uh, there we did two things. One thing is we found a residue 290. It does not interact with the RNA, but it sits close by. It, its location is very close to the RNA. What we did is to re replace the serine with a bulky residue, tryptophan. So this amino acid has a very large side chain, so it will create some stereo hindrance if the RNA molecules sit there. So after we, we make this mutation, we purify the PN complex that has the same appearance as a wild type uh, N RNA complex. It's a complete ring. But when we try to get RNA from it by phenol exertion or based on UV absorption measurements, we find there's no RNA. And we actually crystallize this empty ring. Uh, there's no RNA inside. And if you look at the density for the tryptophan, if the RNA were there, it will in conflict or steroid hindrance with the tryptophan. So here we did not change any charge residues. We did not disrupt any uh, uh, interactions. All we did is to create some steroid hindrance in the RNA cavity. So the protein is perfectly OK to assemble but RNA cannot sit there anymore. Another thing we did is to digest the RNA, which is already encapsulated. Uh, if you read the old literature, you know, 85 or older, they always say, oh, the RNA is completely protected. There's no way you can remove it. So we didn't believe that, so we tested. And if you treat the complex with enough RNAs, especially if you increase the temperature, you can completely remove the RNA from this complex. 
Uh, after we remove the RNA by uh, heating to 60 degrees, this is a very harsh condition, and the ring still stable. Uh, you still see the same uh, uh, empty capsids, only there's no RNA anymore. So you think that the RNA just gets the head of the RNA and chews it out of the capsid? Yeah, we think the uh, subunit opens and closes randomly from time to time, just breathing. So if you have a lot of RNAs around, especially when you heat it up to keep it open, maybe just chop it. When it becomes smaller fragment, it cannot stay anymore. Uh, we think the minimum length has to be like half of it, like 45. If anything shorter than that, it won't stay anymore. It's just not enough to hold it. Yeah. So we isolated authentic nuclear capsid. This is a viral genome with uh, wild type and protein. Uh, you can see uh, the RNA can be easily removed. Uh, all we did is to increase the amount of RNAs A, nothing more than uh, a, a thing. And the appearance of the empty nuclear capsid is identical to the wild type. So again, this is the same as other RNA or DNA viruses. You have empty capsid and you don't need RNA. Yes? You mean to open it and try to? No, just the, that instead of a loop, you now have a winding set of filament of uh, armors. Yeah. Uh, in other negative strand viruses, we see that. But in VSV, uh, I probably have better explanation later when we look at the very own structures. It is most stable when you form this 10 member ring. Uh, if you try to make it uh, linear or make it a uh, spiral, it's not stable. So I think it's just because of the stability. And also, uh, Rugras group did a survey to see how many, what kind of RNAs are present in E. coli. So the average length of uh, RNA or the bulky part is about 150 uh, nucleotide. So it's not enough to make two, two rounds. So that's why we usually see only a single, uh, single turn. So now I'm going to it's talk. Nucleation. So for nucleating the ring, you're going to be much better off having the RNA. Yes, ring. definitely. So you nucleate the, the complex, you have the RNA. And then if you come in and sneakily remove the RNA, the yeah. ring stays. The is OK. It's, it's captured. Yeah. Uh, but for the uh, 290 trypton mutant, where we don't see RNA at all. Yeah, so the capsid still can assemble. The RNA facilitate assembly stabilize the complex, I mean, the nuclear capsid, but it's not absolutely required. Okay. Yes? Do I buy RNAs A? Yes. Yeah. Proteases, okay. If you start digesting the end, then you are exposing the RNA, then you are degrading it. But the protein is still here. This is, this is the picture after we remove the RNA. It looks the same as with RNA inside. And if you run a gel, you see uh, the end protein complete. Wait, how do you explain in this case when people want to purify the RNA from this V? Yeah. And the RNA, they stay. Leave it on the bench for days, and there is no degradation till you start treating with protease, like protease K, yeah. to digest the end, and yeah. then you purify your. Yeah. So, how, how you can help me understand that? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it depends on temperature and the amount. I think, you know, if you reduce the amount of RNAs A, you know, you're treated one hour, you don't see digestion. But all the unprotected RNA is completely digested. So I think even for mycococcal nucleus, if you add 100 times more and heat it up to 60 degrees, you will be able to digest the RNA. Because you basically open up the thing 
make the RNA exposed. So it has some protection. I don't say, you know, it really depends on the flexibility of the end protein. If it's closed, of course, it's protected. But we cannot think a protein structure as a steady structure. It's actually open, close, open, and close. Just depend on how often and how long it stays closed. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sixty-five. Uh, we didn't try sixty-five. We tried sixty. Yeah, it's not denatured because it has this ring structure, so it kind of stabilizes the protein. Not the M protein in the RNA itself. Is protein is like heat resistant, so it can remain. No, if you if you have monomers of N, it's not heat resistant. Only when it forms this ring. Yeah. By after you incubate under 60 degrees, you mean the RNA, um, they are gone? No. You mean without RNA is a digestion? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. It's still there. If you simply heat it up, it can, it can be restored. It will, when you cool it down, it will go back to what it is. You have to heat it up and digest it with RNA. So let me let me now talk about this bullet shape of the nucleic capsid. Uh, what we think here is the matrix protein played the major role uh, organizing this shape. So if we look at all the different viral uh, structures, uh, there are a lot of spherical viruses that use the icosahedral symmetry, and there are also helical capsids which use this helical symmetry. Those two symmetry requirements are very strict. And the shape is dictated by the assembly of the capsid alone. But for VSV, we consider the symmetry of the nuclear capsid linear. So because if you just have the nuclear capsid, it doesn't form any uh, superhelical structure. It's actually a linear uh, stretch of uh, nuclear capsid. But un only from this superhelical structure inside the baryon. So we want to find out why that's the case. So in collaboration with Dr. Hongzhou's group in UCLA, we carry out the cryo-EM structure uh, image averaging. Uh, he took some uh, pictures of the viral particles. The end and the tips are more flexible, so we cannot do a high-resolution averaging, three-dimensional averaging. But the trunk region, the central part of the particle, are very rigid, uh, uh, very uniform. So he was able to uh, take this three-dimensional uh, averaging to about 10 angstrom resolution. As you can see, there are two coaxial axial helices. The nuclear capsid is in the middle, and the matrix protein is outside of the nuclear capsid. There is a one-to-one -one subunit to subunit ratio. So one subunit of matrix binds to one subunit of N. And the lipid bilayers are also clearly visible. So here I'm showing only the two, two turns of the uh, helical nuclear capsid. If you, if you see this, the subunit in the first turn, and it sits right in between two subunits of the second turn. So the two uh, turns with subunit just shift off by half unit. So it interdigitates from a very stable contact. And you need two turns to complete uh, a, a round. So it, it will repeat itself. So on average, you have 37 and a half subunits of N per turn. And this is a cross section of the particle. You can see the double layer of the lipid membrane. Uh, the blue region corresponds to the matrix protein. They make very close contacts between the turns. They make contacts with the inner lip of the uh, bilayers. Also make close contacts with the nuclear capsid. But if you look at the nuclear capsid, you see gaps in between each turns. So the nuclear capsid only have lateral interactions due to the linear symmetry. 
But in the superhelical uh, arrangement, they don't actually make direct contacts with each other uh, vertically. So this is a close-up uh, picture. So here are three turns of matrix, three single subunits. And you can see uh, they have very close contact between the turns. And two turns interact with one uh, turn of nuclear capsid, or two nuclear capsid turns interact with one uh, matrix protein. If you rotate 90 degrees, now we are look from outside into the uh, helix. Uh, the matrix protein make direct lateral interaction with number number three. Also make vertical interactions between the two turns, uh, number four. And the other part of the matrix protein uh, make interaction with first turn of N, number one, and the next turn of N, number two. Uh, here we are looking only at one subunit of the matrix protein. The two-third of the C-terminal domain has been crystallized, and we can fit the crystal structure into the density. There's no crystal structure for the N-terminal part, uh, home called it the hub. But that's where all the interactions take place, both interaction between the matrix and interaction with the N protein subunit. So you can see the diameter, uh, the size of the cylinder, as, long, as well as the height of the cylinder, is determined by the matrix interaction. The N protein is just a resident, or is a prisoner arrested by the matrix it has to follow exactly the symmetry formed by the matrix layer. On the other side, the matrix protein make contacts with the cytoplasmic domain of the G protein, the glycoprotein, which is a trimer on the outside, but it has a transmembrane domain and also a cytoplasmic tail. We think this is where they make contacts. Uh, the symmetry or geometry of this assembly is really uh, almost perfect. On the one side, the matrix has to make interactions with the N protein, which both follow the helical symmetry. But on the other side, the matrix protein need to interact with a trimer of glycoprotein. So just by the dimension and the size of the arrangement, at the point where the matrix protein make contacts with the G protein, the arrangement of ma matrix protein subunits is almost a perfect triangle to accommodate the same size of the uh, glycoprotein. So this is really a very remarkable uh, geometry. So this is how we see the bullet shape is assembled. So the first turn of the uh, nuclear capsid includes 10 subunits, almost the same structure we saw in the crystal. Uh, that is the most stable natural conformation of the uh, nuclear capsid. But because the genome is not uh, 90 bases long, so you have to continue to wrap the nuclear capsid around the first turn. So the second turn has to be a little bit bigger, include more subunits. We estimate maybe two or three subunits more, and just continue to make it bigger and bigger. But when it becomes bigger, it also becomes more flat. The orientation of the subunit turns from almost vertical to almost like 30 degrees tilted. And only after the eighth turn, everything becomes same diameter, uh, same orientation. So that becomes a straight uh, cylinder. That the conformation of this bullet tip is not very stable. That's not the most comfortable conformation of the nuclear capsid. That's why you need all the matrix protein sit in between the, each turn to stabilize this bullet shaped structure. So that's, we think, why the matrix protein is the determinant for this uh, very on shape. So, so we, yeah. Like here, so what do you think about this uh, nuclear capsid bullet shape from the Rugrov lab that didn't have the matrix protein? Yeah. So if the N proteins clearly have a gap, as you're showing in the structure, 
So how can you form a complete bullet um, just by reducing salt content? Yeah, right. I, mean, I think that's what they did, no? They just right. changed the salt. In the isolated nucleic acid, uh, the end protein turns have close contacts. So it's not the same geometry as was in the variant. So the gap is smaller. I don't remember how many subunits per turn. It's not the same as what we see here. And they also have to lower the pH really low. I think it's close to 4, pH 4, to see this uh, structure. So at low pH, the nuclear capsid has a propensity to form this bullet shape, uh, simply because every time you put a turn on it, uh, you may have to make it bigger until it becomes straight. But at physiological conditions, it's not stable. So it has to uh, get the matrix protein in. But when matrix protein come in, the geometry is determined by the matrix, not by the nuclear capsid. But without it, an artificial bullet can be assembled, but it has no, it's not exactly the same size. It has overall shape similar, but not the same size. So we really want to see how the glycoprotein interact with the matrix helix. Uh, here, Dr. Hongzhou did some uh, cryotomography. Uh, this is a few sections uh, together. You can see the glycoproteins are scattered around on the membrane envelope. It, here is a close-up where he picked out a few uh, triangles where, by local averaging, he can show this density correspond to the trimer of the glycoprotein. But the major thing we notice is the glycoproteins don't form a regular array. It's just randomly get uh, incorporated into the variant at different locations. And there are also some dimers and monomers. They are no, not all completely trimers. Uh, we're still working on this and try to get a higher resolution structure and to see how it interacts with the matrix. And we also notice there's something inside the nuclear capsid uh, we don't know exactly what they are. <laughs> Maybe the polymerase. Maybe, yeah. Yes. Could be some uh, host proteins as well. So probably all kind of things can be in there. Host. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is the encapsulation of the genome. Because uh, for many years, uh, there was always a thought that maybe a unique sequence in the genome, which is a packaging signal. And people have been looking for that for many, many years. But based on the crystal structure, we know the N protein cannot recognize any sequence. And there can be no double strand RNA or any three dimensional structures. So, why the genome is specifically encapsulated by by the viral N protein. So here is our hypothesis. We don't have uh, all the evidence, but we think there is some good thing that suggests this model may be correct. So the genome is completely in sequestered in the nucleic capsid. The P protein, which is the dimer, can recognize the nucleic capsid and bring the polymerase to the site. Once the polymerase binds to the nucleic capsid, it can open the end protein and get the sequence out. And recognize the sequence, it will initiate replication. As soon as enough uh, RNA stick out, the new uh, end protein will come in and encapsulate uh, this uh, newly synthesized viral genome. And this process is active. The end protein goes there, grab the uh, newly synthesized RNA very quickly. So that's why we think the end protein is mostly used to encapsulate genome RNA instead of sitting around to encapsulate other RNA. If you don't have replication going on, the end protein will grab any RNA available. But when the replication takes place, there is an active process to bring the end protein to the replication site. So now let me briefly talk about the P protein. Uh, the P protein in, uh, in this virus family, they all have different shape, different uh, lengths. Uh, but they basically have three domains. One domain at the C terminal end, which recognizes nucleic capsid as template. There's a oligomerization domain in the middle. And the N domain acts as a chaperone to keep the N protein RNA free. 
So uh, VSV P is probably the smallest one. So we first solve a crystal structure where we see how the C terminal domain of P recognize a nuclear capsid. Here we have three protein subunit line up in the genome or in the nuclear capsid in a parallel fashion and the C terminal domain of P sit in between, right in between two subunits. So this is the close up of that binding site. Majority of the amino acids are contributed by one N subunit, but you to complete the binding site you need another one. So you need a neighboring N protein subunit. So only when these two come together, you form this high affinity binding site for the C terminal domain of P. That's why the P can recognize the nuclear capsid, uh, use it as a template. And the orientation of this domain is perfect for lining up the L protein around here. And here is where the RNA genome sits. So this is geometry uh, is consistent with its function. Uh, we also solve the crystal structure of the oligomerization domain. It's the second domain next to the uh, C-terminal domain. It's a very stable dimer, involves some uh, domain swap. So we have beta sheets on one side and the other. It's a perfectly symmetrical, a two-fold relationship between the two. And we have a central helix uh, right here. So this uh, dimer is really stable. And P-protein has been shown by other groups as well function as a dimer in, the, in, in all the processes. But in the crystal structures, we also notice a super interaction between two dimers. So the beta sheets of one make a continuous extension with the beta sheets of the other. And there are four hydrogen bonds between these two. And this is a, a pretty stable interaction as well. So we try to infer some uh, uh, information from this. We think this is probably what's happening. So this is, represents the template with the N protein subunits protecting the genome. And this is the newly synthesized viral RNA. The polymerase L is represented with this green shape. It has probably one P dimer associated with it very tightly. And this will move along with the uh, polymerase when it reads through from three prime N to the five prime end. But we also have other P protein dimers, which act as chevron, which bind to the free N protein subunit, then transport that to the site of rep replication. <coughs> Through that dimer-dimer interaction, it can place the N protein in the right location and ready to encapsulate any RNA just newly produced. Once the uh, N protein subunit is incorporated into the growing nuclear capsid, the P protein of this P protein dimer is released and go back and continue to bring more and more N subunit to the site. So this uh, process is very efficient and shuffle all the N protein subunit to the site of replication so you see uh, new genomes is uh, encapsulated. So uh, for future uh, directions, uh, we want to understand how the nucleic capsid can have some function during viral RNA synthesis. One thing uh, interesting to us is how the polymerase recognize the sequence inside the nucleic capsid, because it has to use it as a promoter for transcription or recognize the 3 prime end for replication. Uh, Dr. Benedict's group uh, from Cleveland Clinic uh, Foundation, uh, he had this hypothesis. So at the beginning, you only have L protein and P protein bonding by the virion, and also it can probably bring some host proteins with it, and that serves as so-called a transcriptase. And this complex can recognize a unique sequence uh, at the uh, gene junction in front of N gene, and use that as the promoter for transcription. Later on, when you have more N protein, which form complex with P, and now you have a different complex which bind to the nucleic capsid. At this time, it will only start new RNA synthesis from this three prime end. It doesn't cap. It doesn't make any. Uh, does not stop at any gene junction. So the conformational switch is probably bonding by additional N protein. So we want to test this hypothesis and also try to see 
if the nuclear capsule has some contribution to this recognition. So as I mentioned before, we can remove the RNA from the ring to generate empty rings. And at this stage, we will be able to put any RNA sequence in this ring as we wish. Uh, the first uh, gene junction in front of N has seven U, we call the poly U track, in front of the promoter. And the promoter usually have a conserved GA sequence followed by some other sequences. Uh, so how the polymerase uh, recognize this sequence hidden inside the nuclear capsule? That's what we try to understand. Uh, we test our uh, method to see if we can put any specific sequence back in. Uh, we first use some poly A, poly U, poly G, and poly C. What we find out is the RNA stacking, the packaging, packing inside the cavity is not the same for different sequences. So for poly A, it forms a very rigid structure, very stable. If you have poly U, it's very flexible. You don't see a lot of uh, structure density inside. So we think probably sequence dependent when some sequence in one particular region, that region will become more flexible and some sequence in other region may become more rigid, especially if you have a weak spot followed by a hard spot, then you're probably making a break somewhere for the polymerase to recognize. So we have some indirect evidence from our collaborator, Gail Wurz lab. She, based on our crystal structure, she made a bunch of mutations. One of the mutations at position 347, where the P and N interacts. In this mutant, what she find out is the replication is roughly the same, a little bit lower, but not much. However, the transcription level increased dramatically. Moreover, they actually uh, see a lot of read-throughs between the first gene and the second gene. In another word, the termination in this particular mutant is not very efficient. And she continued to passage the virus uh, several runs. So after passage 5 and 8, you can see at this junction, instead of have 7 U, now it has 8 U. So basically, we think make the spot even softer. So that increases the efficiency of termination. So as you can see, the structural changes or interactions in N uh, influence uh, efficiency of transcription. And we think the structure of the RNA inside the N has something to do with it. We will continue along this line to look at the structure of L and how it interacts with the sequence and the nuclear capsule. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people who are working in my lab and my collaborators, Gail Wurzlaff in University of Virginia, Hongzhou did all the cryo-EM from UCLA, and some other work I didn't mention. Thank you. But in this particular structure, there are no arrows. We know exactly how many molecules in the structure. But they do. there are different various particles. Some have 39 and a half. Some may have 38 and a half. But that, those are minorities. Majority of the particles have precisely 37 and a half subunit per turn. So in, uh, why, in average, uh, so many more P's and L's are packaged in the Yeah. Okay. So if uh, you just need two of them and you know, a couple of more, then average at least, you know, from what's standing now, it's 400 P's and 50 L's. So. Right. Uh, I think there's a paper from Isaac Panak's group where he looked at how P protein helps the transportation of the newly formed nuclear capsid from the site of replication to plasma membrane. So there's an active transportation through microtubule. And P protein seem to play a role in that transportation. So P not only bring L on, 
also help to propel the unit capsule to okay, the so site. Those peas are just going to stay on the template and get packaged. Right. The virus. Right. So, so in, in, in your opinion, based on your stuff, there's going to be some peas that are going to be associated with the algae. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be some peas that are just going to be there. Yeah, that's my guess. I have no proof. Yeah, but that's my guess. Because if you look at number of protein molecules just in the infected cells, just the number, you have a lot more P around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Michael. I think this paper, I'm just curious, what is the evolutionary advantage to having such a thermally stable structure for that ring? Uh, the ring is artifact. I think the ring is artificial. The nucleic capsid, when it's linear, is much less stable compared to the ring. So you don't really see the ring in the virus replication cycle. The nucleic capsid is more stable than others. That's true. But uh, evolutionary advantage, I really don't know. They in fact cows, maybe the animal's too big or something. <laughs> 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 maybe it's the environment. Maybe it has to go to the harsh environment. Ready yeah. for global warming. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So as long as you're speaking about evolution, you have several viruses that have similar structure. Is yes. there any, any suggestion that they evolved from some common ancestor? Is there any way to asking, addressing that question? Yeah, it's all based on sequence and structural comparisons. Mm -hmm. And you can trace back to probably a common uh, ancestor. Has that been done in this family? Yeah, the analysis has been done based on sequence and structure. But I don't think we have find one which represents the ancestor. Yeah. So when you are talking about the encapsulation happening at a replication site, you mean the uh, uh, when the only when the RNA accumulates to a certain level, they can bring the uh, nuclear capsid protein at the replication site, which means there are accumulation of uh, naked RNA template. Or yes. No, no, no. There's no naked RNA. It's only messenger RNA and the viral proteins. As soon as the genes is copied instead of transcribed, then the N protein will encapsulate that. You have to have enough N protein to start. Even if you don't have enough, it won't even start. Yeah. All right. So let's thank Ming Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeff Hodges, uh -huh. who is the first author on the polymerase paper. Uh, the, uh, we submitted the paper to the it's out now. No, I just was in there yesterday to talk to Adam. Yeah, I do too because uh, I can play because um, uh, on Fridays I run on every Friday I run uh, uh, the quiz and they're saying we had two other shots and we got to write the numbers down and we can find cheaper jobs. And in addition to that, there's some software that I want to use for feedback. So I think we can do it really well fast. We can do probably just by sticker because there's these little these lights. So so the stickers are easy to come off. So you mentioned that they have the same. So we could use even just like these. We don't need to 